A new open letter to Comrade Burnham by Leon Trotsky. This is from In Defense of Marxism. Dear Comrade, You have expressed as your reaction to my article on the petty bourgeois opposition. I have been informed that you do not intend to argue over the dialectic with me and that you will discuss only the, quote, concrete questions, end quote. Quote, I stopped arguing about religion long ago, end quote, you added ironically. I once heard Max Eastman voice this same sentiment. Is there logic in identifying logic with religion? As I understand this, your words imply that the dialectic of Marx, Engels, and Lenin belongs to the sphere of religion. What does this assertion signify? The dialectic, permit me to recall, once again is the logic of evolution. Just as a machine shop and a plant supplies instruments for all departments, so logic is indispensable for all spheres of human knowledge. If you do not consider logic in general to be a religious prejudice, sad to say, the self-contradictory writing of the opposition incline one more and more towards this lamentable idea, then just which logic do you accept? I know of two systems of logic worthy of attention. The logic of Aristotle, formal logic, and the logic of Hegel, the dialectic. Aristotelian logic takes as its starting point immutable objects and phenomenon. The scientific thought of our epoch studies all phenomenon in their origin, change and disintegration. Do you hold that the progress of the sciences, including Darwinism, Marxism, modern physics, chemistry, etc., has not influenced in any way the forms of our thought? In other words, do you hold that in a world where everything changes, the syllogism alone remains unchanged and eternal? The Gospel according to St. John begins with the words, quote, in the beginning was the word, end quote, i.e., in the beginning was reason or the word. Reason expressed the word in the word, namely, the syllogism. To St. John, the syllogism is one of the literary pseudonyms for God. If you consider that the syllogism as immutable, i.e., has neither origin nor development, then it signifies that to you is the product of divine revelation. If you acknowledge that the logical forms of our thought develop in the process of our adaptation to nature, then please take the trouble to inform us just who following Aristotle analyzed and systematized the subsequent pressure of logic. So long as you do not clarify this point, I shall take the liberty of asserting that to identify logic, the dialectic, with religion reveals utter ignorance and superficiality, in the basic questions of human thought. New section. Is the revolutionist not obliged to fight against religion? Let us grant, however, that you, your more than presumptuous innuendo is correct. But this does not improve affairs to your advantage. Religion, as I hope you will agree, diverts attention away from real to fictitious knowledge away from the struggle for a better life to false hopes for reward in the hereafter. Religion is the opium of the people. Whoever fails to struggle against religion is unworthy or bearing the name of revolutionist. So me, of bearing the name of revolutionist. On what grounds, then, do you justify your refusal to fight against the dialectic if you deem it one of the varieties of religion? You stopped bothering yourself long ago, as you say, about the question of religion, but you stopped only for yourself. In addition to you, there exist all the others. Quite a few of them. We revolutionists never, quote, stop, end quote, bothering ourselves about religious questions, inasmuch as our task consists in emancipating from the influence of religion, not only ourselves, but also the masses. If the dialectic is a religion, how is it possible to renounce the struggle against the opium within one's own party? Or perhaps you intend to imply that religion is of no political importance. That it is possible to be religious, and at the same time a consistent communist and revolutionary fighter. You will hardly venture so rash an assertion. Naturally, we maintain the most considerate attitude toward the religious prejudices of a backward worker. Should he desire to fight for our program, we would accept him as a party member. But at the same time, 
our party would persistently educate him in the spirit of materialism and atheism. If you agree with this, how can you refuse to struggle against a, quote, religion, end quote, held to my knowledge by the overwhelming majority of those members of your own party who are interested in theoretical questions? You have obviously overlooked this most important aspect of the question. Among the educated bourgeoisie, there are not a few who have broken personally with religion, but whose atheism is solely for their own private consumption. They keep thoughts like these to themselves, but in public often maintain that it is well the people have a religion. Is it possible that you hold such a point of view toward your own party? Is it possible that this explains your refusal to discuss with us the philosophic foundations of Marxism? If that is the case, under your scorn for the dialectic rings a note of contempt for the party. Please do not make the objection that I have based myself on a phrase expressed by you in private conversation, and that you are not concerned with publicly refuting dialectical materialism. This is not true. Your winged phrase serves only as an illustration. Whenever there has been an occasion, for various reasons you have proclaimed your negative attitude toward the doctrine, which constitutes the theoretical foundation of our program. This is well known to everyone in the party. In the article, Intellectuals in Retreat, written by you, James Burnham, in collaboration with Schachtman, and published in the party's theoretical organ, it is categorically affirmed that you reject dialectical materialism. Doesn't the party have the right, after all, to know just why? Do you really assume that in the Fourth International, an editor of a theoretical organ can confine himself to the bare declaration, quote, I decisively reject dialectical materialism, end quote, as if it were a question of a proffered cigarette? Quote, thank you, I don't smoke, end quote. The question of a correct philosophical doctrine, that is, a correct method of thought, is of decisive significance to a revolutionary party, just as a good machine shop is decisive is of decisive significance to production. It is still possible to defend the old society with the material and intellectual methods inherited from the past. It is absolutely unthinkable that this old society can be overthrown and a new society constructed without first critically analyzing the current methods. If the party errs in the very foundation of its thinking, it is your elementary duty to point out the correct road. Otherwise, your conduct will be interpreted inevitably as the cavalier attitude of an academician toward a proletarian organization which, after all, is incapable of grasping a real, quote, scientific, end quote, doctrine. What could be worse than that? New section. Instructive examples. Anyone acquainted with the history of struggles of tendencies within workers' parties knows that desertions to the camp of opportunism, and even to the camp of bourgeois reaction, began not infrequently with rejection of the dialectic. Petty bourgeois intellectuals consider the dialectic the most vulnerable point in Marxism, and at the same time, petty bourgeois intellectuals take advantage of the fact that it is much more difficult for workers to verify differences on the philosophical than on the political plane. This long-known fact is backed by all the evidence of experience. Again, it is impermissible to discount an even more important fact, namely, that all the great and outstanding revolutionists, first and foremost, Marx, Engels, Lenin, Luxembourg, Franz Mehring, stood on the ground of dialectical materialism. Um. Can it be assumed that all of them were incapable of distinguishing between science and religion? Isn't there too much presumptuousness on your part, Comrade Burnham? 
the examples of Bernstein, Kautsky, and Franz Mehring are extremely instructive. Bernstein categorically rejected the dialectic as, quote, scholasticism, end quote, end quote, mysticism, end quote. Kautsky maintained indifference toward the question of the dialectic, some what like Comrade Schachmann. Mehring was a tireless propagandist and defender of dialectic materialism. For decades, Franz Mehring followed all of the innovations of philosophy and literature, indefatigably exposing the reactionary essence of idealism, neo-Kantianism, utilitarianism, all forms of mysticism, etc. The political fate of these three individuals is very well known. Bernstein ended his life as a smug, petty bourgeois. Democrat Kautsky, from a centrist, became a vulgar opportunist. As for Franz Mehring, he died a revolutionary communist. In Russia, three very prominent academic Marxists, Struva, Bulgakov, and Berdyaev, B-E-R-D-Y-A-E-F, Um, says Peter Struva, uh, was a Russian political economist, philosopher, historian, and editor. Peter Struva started his career as a Marxist, later became a liberal, and after the Bolshevik Revolution, joined the White Movement. From 1920, Struva lived in exile in Paris, where he's a prominent critic of Russian communism. Uh, Sergei Bulgakov was a Russian Orthodox theologian, priest, philosopher, and economist. Orthodox writer and scholar David Bentley Hart has said that Bulgakov was, quote, the greatest systematic theologian of the 20th century, end quote. Uh, Father Sergei Bulgakov also served as his spiritual father and confessor to Mother Maria Skobstova, who was canonized as a saint by the Holy Synod of the Ecumenical Patriarchate on the 16th of January, 2004. I don't know if that's the right guy, but I'm going to assume it is. And... Berdyaev. And it says, uh, looks like this Berdeyev, Berdey, Berdeyev, 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 I don't know if I'm saying his name right. Nikolai Alexandrovich Berdeyev was a Russian philosopher, theologian, and Christian existentialist who emphasized the existential spiritual significance of human freedom and the human person. Alternative historical spellings of his name in English include Berdeyev, um, it's not important. Uh, Russian paleontologist and Christian apologist Alexander V. Kramov attributes his ideas about an atemporal human fall to Beriev and Evgeny Nikolaevich Trubetskoy. <laughs> I don't know if I said any of that correct, but uh, I don't know who any of these people are, so... I mean, I've heard of Peter Struba, but mm, I don't know much about him. Now I know not as much as you do, maybe. In the United States, Eastman... Excuse me. In Russia, three very prominent academic Marxists, Struva, Bulgakov, and Berdyaev began by rejecting the philosophic doctrine of Marxism and ended in the camp of reaction in the Orthodox Church. 
In the United States, Eastman, Sidney Hook, and their friends utilized opposition to the dialectic as cover for their transformation from fellow travelers of the proletariat to fellow travelers of the bourgeoisie. Similar examples by the score could be cited from other countries. The example of Plekhanov, which appears to be an exception, in reality only proves the rule. Plekhanov was a remarkable propagandist of dialectical materialism, but during his whole life, he never had the opportunity of participating in the actual class struggle. Plekhanov's thinking was divorced from practice. The revolution of 1905 and subsequently the World War flung Plekhanov into the camp of petty bourgeois democracy and forced Plekhanov in actuality to renounce dialectical materialism. During the World War, Plekhanov came forward openly as the protagonist of the Kantian categorical imperative in the sphere of international relations, quote, do not do unto others as you would not have them do unto you, end quote. This example of Plekhanov only proves that dialectical materialism, in and of itself, still does not make a man a revolutionist. Schachtman, on the other hand, argues that Liebknecht left a posthumous work against dialectical materialism, which he had written in prison. Many ideas enter a person's mind while in prison, which cannot be checked by association with other people. Liebknecht, whom nobody, least of all himself, considered a theoretician, became a symbol of heroism in the world labor movement. Should any of the American opponents of the dialectic display similar self-sacrifice and independence from patriotism during war, we shall render what is due him as a revolutionist. But that will not thereby resolve the question of the dialectic method. It is impossible to say what Leibniz's own final conclusions would have been had Leibniz remained at liberty. In any case, before publishing his work, undoubtedly Leibniz would have shown it to his more competent friends, namely Franz Mehring and Rosa Luxemburg. It is quite probable that on their advice he would have simply tossed the manuscript into the fire. Let us grant, however, that against the advice of people far excelling Liebknecht in the sphere of theory, Liebknecht nevertheless had decided to publish his work. Franz Mehring, Rosa Luxemburg, Lenin, and others would not, of course, have proposed that lie be expelled for this, that he be expelled for this from the party. On the contrary, they would have intervened decisively in his behalf had anyone made such a foolish proposal. But at the same time, they would not have formed a philosophical block with him, but rather would have differentiated themselves decisively from his theoretical mistakes. Comrade Schachtman's behavior, we note, is quite otherwise. Quote, you will observe, he says, excuse me, quote, you will observe, end quote, he says, and this to teach the youth, exclamation point, quote, that Plekhanov was an outstanding theoretician of dialectical materialism, but ended up an opportunist. Leibniz was a remarkable revolutionist, but Leibniz had had his doubts about dialectical materialism, end quote. This argument, if it means anything at all, signifies that dialectical materialism is of no use whatsoever to a revolutionist. With these examples of Leibniz and Plekhanov, artificially torn out of history, Schatzman reinforces and, quote, deepens, end quote, the idea of his last year's article, namely, that politics does not depend on method, inasmuch as method is divorced from politics through the divine gift of inconsistency. By falsely interpreting two, quote, exceptions, end quote, Schatzman seeks to overthrow the rule. If this is the argument of a, quote, supporter, end quote, of Marxism, what can we expect from an opponent? The revision of Marxism passes here into its downright liquidation. More than that, into the liquidation of every doctrine and every method. New section. What do you propose instead?
Dialectical materialism is not, of course, an eternal and immutable philosophy. To think otherwise is to contradict the spirit of the dialectic. Further, development of scientific thought will undoubtedly create a more profound doctrine into which dialectical materialism will enter merely as structural material. However, there is no basis for expecting that this philosophic revolution will be accomplished under the decaying bourgeois system, without mentioning the fact that a Marx is not born every year every decade. The life and death task of the proletariat now consists not in interpreting the world anew, but in remaking the world anew from top to bottom. In the next epoch, we can expect great revolutionists of action, but hardly a new Marx. Only on the basis of socialist culture will mankind feel the need to review the ideological heritage of the past, and undoubtedly will far surpass not only in the sphere of economy, but also in the sphere of intellectual creation. The regime of the Bonapartist bureaucracy in the USSR is criminal, not only because the regime of the Bonapartist bureaucracy in the USSR creates an ever-growing inequality in all spheres of life, but also because the Bonapartist bureaucracy in the USSR degrades the intellectual activity of the country to the depths of the unbridled blockheads of the GPU. Let us grant, however, that contrary to our supposition, the proletariat is so fortunate during the present epoch of wars and revolutions as to produce a new theoretician or a new constellation of theoreticians who will surpass Marxism and in particular advance logic beyond the materialist dialectics. It goes without saying that all advanced workers will learn from the new teachers and the old men will have to re-educate themselves again. But in the meantime... This remains the music of the future. Where am I mistaken? Perhaps you will call my attention to those works which should supplant the system of dialectic materialism for the proletariat. Were these at hand, surely you would not have refused to conduct a struggle against the opium of the dialectic. But none exist. While attempting to discredit the philosophy of Marxism, you do not propose anything with which to replace the philosophy of Marxism. Picture to yourself a young amateur physician who proceeds to argue with a surgeon using a scalpel that modern anatomy, neurology, etc. are worthless, that much in them remains unclear and incomplete, and that only, quote, conservative bureaucrats, end quote, could set to work with a scalpel on the basis of these pseudosciences, etc., I believe that the surgeon would ask his irresponsible colleague to leave the operating room. We too, Comrade Burnham, cannot yield to cheap innuendos about the philosophy of scientific socialism. On the contrary, since in the course of the factional struggle the question has been posed point blank, we shall say, turning to all members of the party, especially the youth, Beware of the infiltration of bourgeois skepticism into your ranks. Remember that socialism to this day has not found higher scientific expression than Marxism. Bear in mind that the method of scientific socialism is dialectic materialism. Occupy yourselves with serious study! Exclamation point. Study Marx, Engels, Plekhanov, Lenin, and Franz Mehring. This is a hundred times more important for you than the study of tendentious, sterile, and slightly ludicrous treaties on the conservatism of James P. Cannon. It just says Cannon, but if you didn't know, James P. Cannon was the leader of the uh, majority wing of the Socialist Workers' Party of the United States. Um, and along with Max Shackman, one of the initiators of American Trotskyism. Let the present discussion produce at least this positive result. That the youth attempt to embed in their minds a serious theoretical foundation for revolutionary struggle. New section. False political, quote, realism, end quote. In your case, however, the question is not confined to the dialectic. 
the remarks in your resolution to the effect that you do not now pose for the decision of the party the question of the nature of the Soviet state, signify in reality that you do pose this question, if not juridically, then theoretically and politically. And the infants can fail to understand this. This very statement likewise has another meaning, for more outrageous and pernicious, so me far more outrageous and pernicious. It means that you divorce politics from Marxist sociology. Yet for us the crux of the matter lies precisely in this. If it is possible to give a correct definition of the state without utilizing the method of dialectical materialism, sorry, it just says dialectic materialism, dialectic materialism, if it is possible correctly to determine politics without giving a class analysis of the state, then the question arises, is there any need whatsoever for Marxism? Disagreeing among themselves on the class nature of the Soviet state, the leaders of the opposition agree on this, that the foreign policy of the Kremlin must be labeled, quote, imperialist, end quote, and that the USSR cannot be conditioned, so it cannot be supported, quote, unconditionally, end quote. Vastly substantial platform, exclamation point. When the opposing, quote, click, end quote, raises the question of the nature of the Soviet state point blank at the convention, what a crime. You have in advance agreed, dot, 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 to disagree, i.e. to vote differently. If the British, quote, national, end quote, government, to me, in the British, quote, national, end quote, government, this precedent occurs of ministers who, quote, agreed to disagree, end quote, i.e. to vote differently. But His Majesty's ministers enjoy this advantage, that they are well aware of the nature of their state and can afford the luxury of disagreement on secondary questions. The leaders of the opposition are far less favorably situated. The leaders of the opposition permit themselves the luxury of differing on the fundamental question in order to solidarize on secondary questions. If this is Marxism and principled politics, then I don't know what unprincipled combinationism means. You seem to consider apparently that by refusing to discuss dialectic materialism and the class nature of the Soviet state, and by sticking to, quote, concrete, end quote, questions, you are acting the part of a realistic politician. This self-deception is a result of your inadequate acquaintance with the history of the past 50 years of factional struggles in the labor movement. In every principled conflict, without a single exception, the Marxist invariably sought to face the party squarely with the fundamental problems of doctrine and program, considering that only tender this condition could the, quote, concrete, end quote, questions, find their proper place and proportion. On the other hand, the opportunists of every shade, especially those who had already suffered a few defeats in the sphere of principle discussion, invariably counterpoised to the Marxist class analysis, quote, concrete, end quote, conjunctural appraisals which they, as is the custom, formulate under the pressure of bourgeois democracy. Through decades of factional struggle, this division of roles has persisted. The opposition, permit me to assure you, has invented nothing new. It is continuing the tradition of revisionism in theory and opportunism in politics. Toward the close of the last century, the revisionist attempts of Bernstein, who in England came under the influence of Anglo-Saxon empiricism and utilitarianism, the most wretched of philosophies were mercilessly repulsed whereupon the German opportunists suddenly recoil from philosophy and sociology. At conventions and in the press, they did not cease to berate the Marxist, quote, pedants, end quote, who replaced the, quote, concrete political questions, end quote, with general principled considerations. Reading over the records of the German social democracy toward the close of the last and the beginning of the present century, and you will be astonished yourself at the degree to which, as the French say, les mots ceci, les filles, the death grip of the living. I don't know if I said any of that right. You are not unacquainted 
with a great role played by Iskra in the development of Russian Marxism. Iskra began with the struggle against the so-called, quote, economism, end quote, in the labor movement and against the, the Narodniki party of the social, the social revolutionists. The chief argument of the, quote, economist, end quote, was that Iskra floats in the sphere of theory while they, the, quote, economist, end quote, proposed leading the concrete labor movement. The main argument of the social revolutionist was as follows. Iskra wants to found a school of dialectic materialism while we want to overthrow czarist autocracy. It must be said that the Narodnik terrorists took their own words very seriously. Bomb in hand, they sacrificed their lives. We argued with them, quote, Under certain circumstances, a bomb is an excellent thing, but we should first clarify our own minds, end quote. It is historical experience that the greatest revolution in all history was not led by the party which started out with bombs, but by the party which started out with dialectic materialism. When the Bolsheviks and the Mensheviks were still members of the same party, the pre-convention periods of the convention itself invariably witnessed an embittered struggle over the agenda. Lenin used to propose as first on the agenda such questions as clarification of the nature of the czarist monarchy, the analysis of the class structure of the excuse me, the class character of the revolution, the appraisal of the stages of the revolution we were passing through, etc. Martov and Don, the leaders of the Mensheviks, invariably objected. We're not a sociological club, but a political party. We must come to an agreement not on the class nature of czarist economy, but on the, quote, concrete political tasks, end quote. I say this from memory, but I do not run any risk of error since these disputes were repeated from year to year and became stereotyped in character. I might add that I personally committed not a few sins on this score myself, but I have learned something since then. To those enamored with, quote, concrete political questions, end quote, Lenin invariably explained that our politics is not of conjunctural, but of principled character. That tactics are subordinate to strategy. That for us the primary concern of every political campaign is that that political campaign guide the workers from the particular questions to the general questions. That the political campaign teach them the nature of modern society and the character of modern society's fundamental forces. The Mensheviks always felt the need urgently to slur over principal differences in their unstable conglomeration by means of evasions, whereas Lenin, on the contrary, posed principled questions point-blank. The current argument of the opposition against philosophy and sociology in favor of, quote, concrete political questions, end quote, is a belated repetition of Don's argument. So that's a relation to Theodore Dan, I believe his name was. He was a Mensch prominent Russian Menshevik. Theodore Dan, um, originally named Gurevich, was a Russian political activist and journalist who helped found the Menshevik faction of the Russian Social Democratic Labor Party. Anyway, the current of arguments of the opposition against philosophy and sociology in favor of, quote, concrete political questions, end quote, is a belated repetition of Don's argument. Not a single new word. How sad it is that Schachtman respects the principled politics of Marxism only when it has aged long enough for the archives. Especially awkward and inappropriate does the appeal to shift from Marxist theory to, quote, concrete political questions, and quote, sound on your lips, Comrade Burnham. For it was not I, but you, who raised the question of the character of the USSR, thereby forcing me to pose the question of the method through which the class character of the state is determined. True enough, you withdrew your resolution, but this factional maneuver 
has no objective meaning whatsoever. You draw your political conclusions from your sociological premise, even if you have temporarily slipped it into your briefcase. Schachtman draws exactly the same political conclusions without a sociological premise. Schachtman adapts himself to you. Aberrant seeks to profit equally both from the hidden premise and the absence of a premise for his, quote, organizational, end quote, combinations. This is the real and not the diplomatic situation in the camp of the opposition. You proceed as an anti-Marxist, Schachtman and Abern as platonic Marxists. Who is worse? It is not easy to determine. New section. The dialectic of the present discussion. When con confronted with the diplomatic front covering the hidden premises and lack of premises of our opponents, we, the quote, conservatives, end quote, naturally reply, a fruitful dispute, dispute over, quote, concrete questions, end quote, is possible only if you clearly specify what class premises you take as your starting point. We are not compelled to confine ourselves to those topics in this dispute, which you have selected artificially. Should someone propose that we discuss as, quote, concrete, end quote, questions the invasion of Switzerland by the Soviet fleet, or the length of a tale of a Bronx witch, then I am justified in posing in advance such questions as, does Switzerland have a sea coast? Are these, are there witches at all? Every serious discussion develops from the particular and even the accidental to the general and fundamental. The in undiate what the hell does that mean? In undiate. Uh, it's funny when I look this up. Um, it, it's a, it actually takes me to. It's actually like a quote. It's actually. It seems like people have looked this up before. Um, but I'm getting nothing. Maybe it's a. In is this typo? So I guess it's like in undate. I don't fucking know. <laughs> anyway, the in undate in the in undiat. <laughs> I don't fucking know. The causes and motives of a discussion are of interest in most cases only symptomatically. Of actual political significance are only those problems which the discussion raises in its development. To certain intellectuals anxious to indict bureaucratic conservatism and to display their, quote, dynamic spirit, end quote, it might seem that questions concerning the dialectic Marxism, the nature of the state, centralism are raised, quote, artificially, end quote, and that the discussion has taken a, quote, false direction. <sighs> the nub of the matter, however, consists in this. That discussion has its own objective logic, which does not coincide at all with the subjective logic of individuals and groupings. The dialectic character of the discussion proceeds from the fact that its objective course is determined by the living conflict of opposing tendencies, and not by a preconceived logical plan. The materialist basis of the discussion consists in its reflecting the pressure of different classes. Thus the present discussions in the, in the SWP. Like the historic process as a whole, develops, with or without your permission, comrade Burnham, according to the laws of dialectical materialism, there is no escape from these laws.
new section. Quote, science, end quote, against Marxism, and quote, experiments, end quote, against program. Accusing your opponents of, quote, bureaucratic conservatism, end quote, a bare psychological abstraction insofar as no specific social interests are shown underlying this, quote, conservatism, to me, conservatism, end quote. You demand in your document that conservative politics be replaced by, quote, critical and experimental politics, in a word, scientific politics, end quote. This statement at first glance so innocent and meaningless with all its pompousness is in itself a complete exposure. You don't speak of Marxist politics. You don't speak of proletarian politics. You speak of, quote, experimental, end quote, quote, critical, quote, scientific, end quote, politics. Why this pretentious and deliberately obtruse terminology is so unusual in your ranks, to me, in our ranks? I shall tell you, it is the product of your adaptation, Comrade Burnham, to bourgeois public opinion, and the adaptation of Schachtman and Aberin to your adaptation. Marxism is no longer fashionable among the broad circles of bourgeois intellectuals. Moreover, if one should mention Marxism, God forbid, he might be taken for a dialectic materialist. It is better to avoid this discredited word. What to replace it with? Why, of course, with, quote, science, end quote, even with science capitalized. And science, as everybody knows, is based on, quote, criticism and, quote, experiments. It has its own ring so solid, so tolerant, so unsectarian, so professional. With this formula, one can enter any democratic salon. Reread, please, your own statement once again, quote, in place of conservative politics, we must put bold, flexible, critical, and experimental politics. In a word, scientific politics, end quote. You couldn't have improved it. But this is precisely the formula which all petty bourgeois empiricists, all revisionists, and last but not least, all political adventurers have counterposed to, quote, narrow, quote, limited, quote, dogmatic, and quote, conservative Marxism. Buffon once said, the style is the man. What the fuck is Buffon? Um, Buffon was a French naturalist, mathematician, and cosmologist. Buffon held the position of intendant, director of the Jardin du Voir, now called the Jardin des Plantes. No oh, fucking know. Buffon once said, the style is the man. Political terminology is not only the man, but the party. Terminology is one of the elements of the class struggle. Only lifeless pedants can fail to understand this. In your document, you painstakingly expunge, yes, no one else but you, comrade Burnham. Not only such terms as the dialectic and materialism, but also Marxism. You are above all this. You are a man of, quote, critical, quote, experimental science. For exactly the same reason, you called the label, quote, imperialism, end quote, to describe the foreign policy of the Kremlin. This innovation differentiates you from two, the too embarrassing terminology of the Fourth International. By creating less, quote, sectarian, end quote, less, quote, religious, end quote, less rigorous formulas, common to you and no happy coincidence, Bourgeois democracy.
You want to experiment? Question mark. But permit me to write, to permit me permit me to remind you that the workers' movement possesses a long history, with no lack of experience, and if you prefer experiments. This experience, so dearly bought, has been crystallized in the shape of a definite doctrine, the very Marxism whose name you so carefully avoid. Before giving you the right to experiment, the party has the right to ask, what method will you use? Henry Ford would scarcely permit a man to experiment in his plant who had not assimilated the requisite conclusions of the past development of industry and the innumerable experiments already carried out. Furthermore, experimental laboratories and factories are carefully segregated from mass production. Far more impermissible even are witch doctor experiments in the sphere of the labor movement, even though conducted under the banner of anonymous, quote, science, end quote. For us, the science of the workers' movement is Marxism. Nameless social science. Science, with a capital letter, we leave these completely at the disposal of Eastman and Eastman's ilk. I know that you have engaged in disputes with Eastman, and in some questions you have argued very well. But you debate with Eastman as a representative of your own circle and not as an agent of the class enemy. You revealed this conspicuously in your joint article with Shackman when you ended up with the unexpected invitation to Eastman, Hook, Lyons, and the rest that, you, that they take advantage of the pages of the New International to promulgate their views. It did not even concern you that they might pose the question of the dialectic and thus drive you out of your diplomatic silence. On the 20th of January of last year, Hence, long prior to this discussion, in a letter to Comrade Schachtman, I insisted on the urgent necessity of attentively following the internal development of the Stalinist party. I wrote, quote, It would be a thousand times more important than inviting Eastman, Lyons, and the others to present their personal s sweatings. I was wondering a bit why you gave space to Eastman's last insignificant and arrogant article. Lie has it, excuse me, Lie has at his disposal Harper's Magazine. I think it's supposed to say he. I don't know, I think it's actually happened a couple times in this thing where he is. He's, I don't know what the fuck is what I'm reading. He has at his disposal Harper's Magazine, Modern Monthly, Common Sense, etc. But I am absolutely perplexed that you personally invited these people to besmirch the not-so-numerous pages of the New International. The perpetuation of this polemic can interest some petty bourgeois intellectuals, but not the revolutionary elements. It is my firm conviction that a certain reorganization of the New International and the Socialist Appeal is necessary more distance from Eastman, Lyon, etc., and nearer to the workers, and in this sense to the Stalinist party, end quote. As always in such cases, Shackman replied inattentively and carelessly. In actuality, the question was resolved by the fact that the enemies of Marxism, whom you invited, refused to accept your invitation. This episode, however, deserves closer attention. On the one hand, you, Comrade Burnham, Bolstered by Schachtman, invite bourgeois Democrats to send in friendly explanations to be printed in the pages of our party organ. On the other hand, you, bolstered by this same Schachtman, refuse to engage in a debate with me over the dialectic and the class nature of the Soviet state. Doesn't this signify that you, together with your ally Schachtman, have turned your faces somewhat toward the bourgeois semi-opponents and your backs toward your own party? Aberrant long ago came to the conclusion that Marxism is a doctrine to be honored, but a good oppositional combination is something far more substantial. Meanwhile, Schachtman slips and slides downward, consoling himself with wisecracks. I feel, however, that Schachtman's heart is a trifle heavy. Upon reaching a certain point, Schachtman will, I hope, pull himself together and begin the upward climb again. Here is the hope that Sch Schachtman's, quote, experimental, end quote, factional politics 
will at least turn out to the profit of, quote, science, end quote. New section. Quote, an unconscious dialectician. I've been sick like five times this winter. Oh no, it's five may be an exaggeration. Four is, four is likely though. And at least three. New section, quote, an unconscious dialectician, end quote. Using as his text my remark concerning Darwin, Shackman has stated, I have been informed that you are a, quote, unconscious dialectician, end quote. This ambiguous compliment contains an iota of truth. Every individual is a dialectician to some extent or other, in most cases unconsciously. A housewife knows that a certain amount of salt-flavored flavors soup agreeably, but that added small salt makes the soup unpalatable. Consequently, an illiterate peasant woman guides herself in cooking soup by the Hegelian law of the transformation. Oh, All right, I'll be over. All right, the party starts at two. Okay. Okay. I guess text me when you do get there. Um, the housewife knows what a certain amount of salt flavors, that a certain amount of salt flavors soup agreeably, but that added salt makes the soup unpalatable. Consequently, an illiterate peasant woman guides herself in cooking soup by the Hegelian law of transformation of quantity into quality. Similar examples from daily life could be cited without end. Even animals arrive at their practical conclusions not only on the basis of Aristotelian syllogism, but also on the basis of the Hegelian dialectic. Thus, a fox is aware that quadrupeds and birds are nutritious and tasty. On inciting a hare, a rabbit, or a hen, a fox concludes, this particular creature belongs to the tasty and nutritive type and chases after the prey. We have here a complete syllogism although the fox, we may suppose, never read Aristotle. When the same fox, however, encounters the first animal which exceeds its size, for example, a wolf, it quickly concludes that quantity passes into quality and turns to flee. Le clearly, the legs of a fox are equipped with Hegelian tendencies, even if not fully conscious Hegelian tendencies. All this demonstrates in passing that our methods of thought both formal logic and the dialectic, are not arbitrary constructions of our reason, but rather expressions of the actual interrelationships in nature itself. In this sense, the universe throughout is permitted with, permeated with, quote, unconscious, end quote, dialectics. But nature did not stop there. No little development occurred before nature's interrelationships were converted into the language of the consciousness of foxes and men. A man was then enabled to generalize these forms of consciousness and transform them into logical dialectical categories, thus creating the possibility for probing more deeply into the world about us. The most finished expression to date of the laws of the dialectic which prevail in nature and in society has been given by Hegel and Marx. Despite the fact that Darwin was not interested in verifying his logical methods, his empiricism, that of a genius, in the sphere of natural science reached the highest dialectic generalizations. In this sense, Darwin was, as I stated in my previous article, quote, an unconscious dialectician, end quote. We do not, however, value Darwin for his inability to rise to the dialectic, but for having, despite his philosophical backwardness, explained to us the origin of species. Engels was, it might be pointed out, exasperated by the narrow empiricism of the Darwinian method, 
Although Engels, like Marx, immediately appreciated the greatness of the theory of natural selection, Darwin, on the contrary, remained a loss, ignorant of the meaning of Marx's sociology to the end of his life. Had Darwin come out in the press against the dialectic or materialism, Marx and Engels would have attacked Darwin with redoubled force so as not to allow Darwin's authority to cloak ideological reaction. In the attorney's plea of Schachtman to the effect that you are a, quote, unconscious dialectician, end quote, the stress must be laid on the word unconscious. Schachtman's aim, also partly unconscious, is to defend his block with you by degrading dialectic materialism. For in reality, Schachtman is saying the difference between a conscious and a, quote, unconscious dialectician is not so great that one must quarrel about it. Schachtman thus attempts to discredit the Marxist method. But the evil goes even beyond this. Very many unconscious or semi-unconscious dialecticians exist in this world. Some of them apply the materialist dialectic excellently to politics, even though they have never concerned themselves with questions of method. It would obviously be pedantic blockheadedness to attack such comrades. But it is otherwise with you, Comrade Burnham. You are an editor of the theoretical organ whose task it is to educate the party in the spirit of the Marxist method. You are a conscious opponent of the dialectic, and not at all an unconscious dialectician. Even if you had, as Schachtman insists, successfully followed the dialectic in political questions, i.e. even if you endowed with a dialectic, quote, instinct, end quote, we would still be compelled to begin a struggle against you because your dialectic instinct, like other individual qualities, cannot be transmitted to others, whereas the conscious dialectic method can, to one degree or another, be made accessible to the entire party. The Dialectic and Mr. Dies D-I-E-S, might be Dies as well, but I'm not sure. Even if you have a dialectic instinct, and I do not undertake to judge this, it is well nigh stifled by academic routine and intellectual about how to I guess that's like pompousness. I guess that's what that means, like how like high culture. In French or whatever, something like that. I'm going to see. Yeah. Haughtiness of nature. To me, haughtiness of manner, disdainful pride. Hauteur. Hauteur. Uh, haut and haughtiness is the appearance of a uh, quality of being arrogantly superior and disdainful. And, you know, I think that's a, I think a, um, Lauren Goldner's uh, blog or website, whatever, break their haughty power, um, uses that word, and that's which is from I believe. Um, from the song Solidarity Forever. Um, break their haughty power, get our freedom when we learn that the union makes us strong. I think it's the lyric. Um, anyway, the dialectic in Mr. Dies. Even if you have a dialectic instinct, and I do not undertake to judge this, it is well nigh stifled by academic routine and intellectual hauteur. What we term the class instinct of the worker accepts with relative ease the dialectic approach to questions. There can be no talk of such a class instinct in a bourgeois intellectual. Only by consciously surmounting this petty bourgeois spirit can an intellectual divorced from the proletariat rise to Marxist politics. Unfortunately, Schachtman and Abern are doing everything in their power to bar this road to you. 
By their support, they render you a very bad service, Comrade Burnham. Bolstered by your block, which might be designated as the, quote, League of Factional Abandon, end quote, you commit one blunder after another, in philosophy, in sociology, in politics, in the organizational sphere. Your errors are not accidental. You approach each question by isolating it, by splitting it away from its connection with other questions, away from connection with social factors, and independently of international experience. You lack the dialectic method. Despite all your education in politics, you proceed like a witch doctor. In the question of the Dyes Committee, your mumbo-jumbo manifested itself no less glaringly in the question of Finland. To my arguments in favor of utilizing this parliamentary body, you reply that the question should be decided not by principled considerations, but by some circumstances known to you alone, which you refrain from specifying. What the fuck is it? Okay. The Dyes Committee is the House on American Activities Committee. Um, which I'll read, you know, if you don't know what that is, I'll read it. Uh, I didn't know that this was another name for it. Um. Sorry, one second. Fucking fans. The House on American... The House Committee on Un-American Activities, Activities, HCUA, properly known as the House Un-American Activities Committee, was an investigative committee of the United States House of Representatives created in 1938. I didn't know it was made while Trotsky was still alive. Um, to investigate alleged disloyalty and subversive activities on the part of private citizens, public employees, and those organizations suspected of having communist ties. It became a standing permanent committee in 1945, and from 1969 onwards, it was known as the House Committee on Internal Security. When the House abolished the committee in 1975, its functions were transferred to the House Judiciary Committee. The committee's anti-communist investigations are often associated with McCarthyism, although Joseph McCarthy himself, as a U.S. Senator, had no direct involvement with the House Committee. McCarthy was the chairman of the Government Operations Committee and the Government Operations Committee's permanent subcommittee on investigations of the U.S. Senate, not the House. So, yeah, I didn't know that the House on American Activities Committee was popularly known as the Dyes Committee. Sorry, one second. In the question of the Dyes Committee, your mumbo jumbo, jumbo manifests itself no less glaringly than in the question of Finland. To my arguments in favor of utilizing this parliamentary body, you replied that the question should be decided not by principled considerations, but by some special circumstances known to you alone, but which you refrain from specifying. Permit me to tell you what these circumstances were, your ideological dependence on bourgeois public opinion. Although bourgeois democracy in all its sections bears full responsibility for the capitalist regime, including the Dyes Committee, it is compelled in the interest of this very same capitalism shamefacedly to distract attention away from the two naked organs of the regime. A simple division of labor. An old fraud which still continues, however, to operate effectively. 
As for the workers to whom you refer negative, suit me to you refer vaguely, a section of the workers, and a very considerable section, is like yourself under the influence of bourgeois democracy. But the average worker, not infected with the prejudices of the labor prejudices of the labor aristocracy, would joyfully welcome every bold revolutionary word thrown in the very face of the class enemy. And the more reactionary the institution which serves as the arena for the combat, all the more complete is the satisfaction of the worker. This has been proved by historical experience. Dies himself becoming frightened and jumping back in time demonstrated how false your position was. It is always better to compel the enemy to retreat than to hide oneself without a battle. But at this point I see the irate figure of Shackman rising to stop me with a gesture of protest. Quote, the opposition bears no responsibility for Burnham's views on the Dyes Committee. This question did not assume a factional character. End quote, and so, so forth and so on. I know all this. As if the only thing that lacked was for the entire opposition to express itself in favor of the tactic of boycott, so utterly senseless in this instance. It is sufficient that the leader of the opposition, who has views and openly expressed them, came out in favor of boycott. If you happen to have outgrown the age when one argues about, quote, religion, end quote, then let me confess, I had considered the entire Fourth International had outgrown the age when abstentionism is accounted the most revolutionary of policies. Aside from your lack of method, you reveal in this instance an obvious lack of political sagacity. Or sagacity. I'm not sure how you pronounce that. In the given situation, a revolutionist would not have needed to discuss long before springing through a door flung open by the enemy and making the most of the opportunity. For those members of the opposition who together with you spoke against participation in the Dyes Committee, and their number is not so small, it is necessary, in my opinion, to arrange special elementary courses in order to explain to them the elementary truths of revolutionary tactics, which have nothing in common with the pseudo-radical abstentionism of the intellectual circles. I don't know what the hell this participation in the Dyes Committee thing is about. Okay. I don't know. Quote, new section, quote, concrete political questions, end quote. Actually, I'm going to take a break. I've read for long enough. Concrete political question. The opposition is weakest precisely in, in the sphere where it imagines itself especially strong, the sphere of day-to-day -day revolutionary politics. This applies above all to you, Comrade Burnham. Impotence in the face of great events manifested itself in you as well as in the entire opposition, most glaringly in the questions of Poland, the Baltic states, and Finland. Schachtman began by discovering a philosopher's stone, the achievement of a simultaneous insurrection against Hitler and Stalin in occupied Poland. The idea was splendid. It is only too bad that Schachtman was deprived of the opportunity of putting it into practice. The advanced workers in eastern Poland could justifiably say, quote, 
a simultaneous insurrection against Hitler and Stalin in a country occupied by troops might perhaps be arranged very conveniently from the Bronx, but here locally it is more difficult. We should like to hear Burnham's and Schachtman's answer to a, quote, concrete political question, end quote. What shall we do between now and the coming insurrection, end quote. In the meantime, the commanding staff of the Soviet army called upon the peasants and workers to seize the land and the factories. This call, supported by armed force, played an enormous role in the life of the occupied country. Moscow papers were filled to overflowing with reports of the boundless, quote, enthusiasm, end quote, of workers and poor peasants. We should and must approach these reports with justifiable distrust. There is no lack of lies, but it is nevertheless impermissible to close one's eyes to facts. The call to settle accounts with the landlords and to drive out the capitalists could not have failed to rouse the spirit of the hounded and crushed Ukrainian and Belarusian peasants and workers who saw in the Polish landlord a double enemy. In the Parisian organ of the Mensheviks, who are in solidarity with the bourgeois democracy of France and not the Fourth International, it was stated categorically that the advance of the Red Army was accompanied by a wave of revolutionary upsurge, echoes of which penetrated even the peasant masses in Romania. What adds special weight to the dispatches of this organ is the close connection with the Mensheviks and the leaders of the Jewish Bund, the Polish Socialist Party, and other organizations who are hostile to the Kremlin and who fled from Poland. We were therefore completely correct when we said to the Bolsheviks in eastern Poland, quote, Together with the workers and peasants and in the forefront, you must conduct a struggle against the landlords and capitalists. Do not tear yourself away from the masses. Despite all their illusions, just as the Russian revolutionists did not tear themselves away from the masses who had not yet freed themselves from their hopes in, in the Tsar. For instance, on Bloody Sunday, January 22nd, 1905. Educate the masses in the course of the struggle. Warn them against naive hopes in Moscow, but do not tear yourself away from them. Fight in their camp. Try to extend and deepen their struggle and to give their struggle the greatest possible independence. Only in this way will you prepare the coming insurrection against Stalin. End quote. The course of events in Poland has completely confirmed this directive, which was a continuation and a development of all our previous policies, particularly in Spain. Since there is no principal difference between the Polish and Finnish situations, we can have no grounds for changing our directive. But the opposition, who failed to understand the meaning of the Polish events, now tries to clutch at Finland as a new anchor of salvation. Quote, where is the civil war in Finland? Trotsky talks of civil war. We have seen nothing about it in the press, end quote, and so on. The question of Finland appears to the opposition as in principle different from the question of Western Ukraine and Belarusia. Belarusia, I guess it says. It says the way it's spelled in this piece is B-Y-E-L-O space Russia. Each question is isolated and viewed aside and apart from the general course of development. Confounded by the course of events, the opposition seeks each time to support itself on some accidental, secondary, temporary, and conjunctural circumstances. Do these cries about the absence of civil war in Finland signify that the opposition would adopt our policy if civil war were actually to unfold in Finland? Yes or no? If yes, then the opposition thereby condemns its own policy in relation to Poland, since in Poland, despite the civil war, they limited themselves to refusal to participate in the events while they waited for a simultaneous uprising against Stalin and Hitler. It is obvious, Comrade Burnham, that you and your allies have not thought this question through to the end. What about my assertion concerning a civil war in Finland? At the very inception of military hostilities, one might have conjectured 
conjectured that Moscow was seeking, though, a, quote, small, end quote, punitive expedition to bring about a change of government is in Helsingfors, and to establish the same relations with Finland as with other Baltic states. But the appointment of the Kunisen, Kunisenen government in Terejoki, or Terejoki, demonstrated that Moscow had other plans and aims. It says here, Otto Wilhelm uh, Villa Kusen. Let's see what, it says, what the thing says here. Otto Villa Kusinen. Kusinen. Otto Villa Kusinen. Was a Finnish born Soviet communist and later Soviet politician, literary historian, and poet who, after the defeat of the Reds in the Finnish Civil War, fled to the Soviet Union where he worked until his death. Kusinen, Kusinen briefly led the so-called Finnish Democratic Republic before serving as chairman of the Presidium of the Supreme Soviet of the Karelo Finnish SSR. But the sorry, so back to the text. But the appointment of the Kusinen government in the Terry. Yoki demonstrated that Moscow had other plans and aims. Dispatches then reported the creation of a Finnish, quote, Red Army, end quote. Naturally, it was only a question of small formations set up from above. The pro pro program of Kusinen, Kunisen was issued to no, it was spelled wrong the first time. God damn it. It's Kusinen, not Kunsinen. Naturally, it was only a question of small formation set up from above. Uh, the program of Kusinen was issued. Next, the dispatches appeared of the division of large estates among poor peasants. In their totality, these dispatches signified an attempt on the part of Moscow to organize a civil war. Naturally, this is a civil war of a special type. It does not arise spontaneously from the depths of the popular masses. It's a civil, it is not conducted under the leadership of the Finnish Revolutionary Party based on math support. It is introduced on bayonets from without. It is controlled by the Moscow bureaucracy. All this we know, and we dealt with all this in discussing Poland. Nevertheless, it is precisely a question of civil war, of an appeal to the lowly, to the poor, a call to the poor to expropriate the rich, drive the rich out, arrest them, etc. I know of no other name for these actions except civil war. Quote, but, after all, the civil war in Finland did not unfold, end quote, object the leaders of the opposition. Quote, this means that you, your predictions did not materialize, end quote. With the defeat and the retreat of the Red Army, I reply, the civil war in Finland cannot, of course, unfold under the bayonets of Mannerheim. This fact is an argument not against me, but against Schachtman, since it demonstrates that in the first stages of war, at a time when discipline in armies is still strong, it is much easier to organize insurrection and on two fronts to boot, from the Bronx, then from Terioki. Just to tell you how that's spelled, it's spelled T-E-R-R-I-J-O-K-I. -E um, and if you know where that is or what that means, I'm assuming it's somewhere in Finland, um, you know more than me. We did not foresee the defeats of the first detachments of the Red Army. We could not have foreseen the extent to which stupidity and demoralization reign in the Kremlin and in the tops of the army backed, me, beheaded by the Kremlin. Nevertheless, what is involved is only a military episode, which cannot determine our political line. Should Moscow, after Moscow's first unsuccessful attempt, 
refrain entirely from any further offensive against Finland, then the very question which today obscures the entire world situation to the eyes of the opposition would be removed from the order of the day. But there is little chance for this. On the other hand, if England, France, and the United States, facing themselves on Scandinavia, were to aid Finland with military force, then the Finnish question would be submerged into a war between the USSR and the imperialist countries. In this case, we must assume that even a majority of the oppositionists would remind themselves of the program of the Fourth International. At the present time, however, the opposition is not interested in these two variants, either the suspension of the offensive on the part of the USSR, or the outbreak of hostilities between the USSR and the imperialist democracies. The opposition is interested only in the isolated question of the USSR's invasion of Poland. Very well. Let us take this as our starting point. If the second offensive, as may be assumed, is better prepared and conducted, then the advance of the Red Army into the country will again place the question of civil war on the order of the day, and moreover on a much broader scale than during the first and ignominiously unsuccessful attempt. Our directive, consequently, remains completely valid so long as the question itself remains on the agenda. But what does the opposition propose in the event that the Red Army successfully advances into Finland and civil war unfolds there? The opposition apparently doesn't think about this at all, for they live from one day to the next, from one incident to another, clutching at episodes, clinging to isolated phrases in an editorial, feeding on sympathies and antipathies, and thus creating for themselves the semblance of a platform. The weakness of empiricists and impressionists is always revealed most glaringly in their approach to, quote, concrete political questions, end quote. New section. Theoretical bewilderment and political abstentionism. Throughout all the vacillations and convulsions of the opposition, contradictory though they may be, Two general features run like a guiding thread from the pinnacles of theory down to the most trifling political episodes. The first general feature is the absence of a unified conception. The opposition leaders split sociology from dialectical materialism. They split pol politics from sociology. In the sphere of politics, they split our tasks in Poland from our experience in Spain. Our tasks in Finland from our position on Poland. History becomes transformed into a series of exceptional incidents. Politics becomes transformed into a series of improvisations. We have here, in the full sense of the term, the disintegration of Marxism, the disintegration of theoretical thought, the disintegration of politics into politics constituent elements. Empiricism and empiricism's foster brother, Impressionism, dominate from top to bottom. That is why the ideological leadership, Comrade Burnham, rests with you as an opponent of the dialectic, as an empiricist, unabashed, unabashed by his empiricism. Throughout the vacillations and convulsions of the opposition, there is a second general feature intimately bound to the first, namely, a tendency to refrain from active participation. A tendency to self-elimination. One second. To abstentionism, naturally under cover of, of ultra-radical phrases. You are in favor of overthrowing Hitler and Stalin in Poland, Stalin and Mannerheim in Finland, and until then, you reject both sides equally. In other words, you withdraw from the struggle, including the civil war. Your citing the absence of civil war in Poland is only an accidental conjunctural argument. Should the civil war unfold, the opposition will attempt not to notice it, as they tried not to notice it in Poland, or they would declare that inasmuch as the policy of the Moscow bureaucracy is, quote, imperialist, end quote, in character, quote, we, end quote, do not take part in this filthy business. Hot on the trail of, quote, concrete, end quote, 
political tasks and words, the opposition actually places itself outside the historical process. Your position, Comrade Burnham, in relation to the Dyes Committee merits attention precisely because it is a graphic expression of this same tendency of abstentionism and bewilderment. Your guiding principle still remains the same. Quote, thank you, I don't smoke, end quote. Naturally, any man, any party, and even class can become bewildered. But with the petty bourgeoisie, bewilderment, especially in the face of great events, is an inescapable and, so to speak, congenital condition. The intellectuals attempt to express their state of bewilderment in the language of, quote, science, end quote. The contradictory platform of the opposition reflects petty bourgeois bewilderment, expressed in the bombastic language of the intellectuals. There is nothing proletarian about it. Where's my water? What'd you do with my water? What'd you do with my water? <sighs> the petty bourgeoisie and centralism. In the organizational sphere, your views are just as schematic, empiric, non-revolutionary, as is the sphere of theory and politics. A. Stolberg, lantern in hand, chases after an ideal revolution, unaccompanied by any excesses, and guaranteed against Thermidor and counter-revolution, you likewise seek an ideal party democracy which would secure forever and for everybody the possibility of saying what in doing whatever popped into his head and which would ensure the party against bureaucratic degeneration. You overlook a trifle, namely, that the party is not an arena for the assertion of free individuality, but an instrument of proletarian revolution, that only a victorious revolution is capable of preventing the degeneration not only of the party, but of the proletariat itself, and of modern civilization as a whole. <sighs> you do not see that our American section is not sick from too much centralism. It is laughable even to talk about it. But from a monstrous abuse and distortion of democracy on the part of petty bourgeois elements, this is at the root of the present crisis. A worker spends his day at the factory. He has comparatively few hours left for the party. At the meetings he is interested in learning the most important things, the correct evaluation of the situation and the political conclusions. The worker values those leaders who do this in the clearest and the most precise form, and who keep in step with events. Petty bourgeois and especially declassed elements, divorced from the proletariat, vegetate in an artificial and shut-in environment. They have ample time to dabble in politics or its substitute. They pick out faults, exchange all sorts of tidbits and gossip concerning happenings among the party, quote, tops, end quote. They always locate a leader who initiates them into all the, quote, secrets, end quote. Discussion is their native element. No amount of democracy is ever enough for them. For their war of words, they seek the fourth dimension. They become jittery. They revolve in a vicious circle. And they quench their thirst with salt water. Do you want to know the organizational program of the opposition? It consists of a mad hunt for the fourth dimension of party democracy. In practice, this means burying politics beneath discussion and burying centralism beneath the anarchy of the intellectual circles. When a few thousand workers join the party, they will call the petty bourgeois anarchists severely to order. The sooner the better. Conclusions Why do I address you and not the other leaders of the opposition? Because you are the ideological leader of the bloc. Comrade Aberns' faction 
destitute of a program and a banner, is ever in need of power. At one time, Shankman served as cover, then must with Spectre, and now you, with Shankman adapting himself to you. Your ideology I consider the expression of bourgeois influence in the proletariat. To some comrades, the tone of this letter may perhaps seem too sharp. Yet let me confess, I did everything in my power to, to restrain myself. For after all, it is a question of nothing more or less than an attempt to reject, disqualify, and overthrow the theoretical foundations, the pr political principles, and organizational methods of our movement. In reaction to my previous article, Comrade Abern, it has been reported, remarked, quote, this means split, end quote. Such a response merely demonstrates that Abern lacks devotion to the party and the Fourth International. Abern is a circle man. In any case, threats of split will not deter us from presenting a Marxist analysis of the differences. For us Marxists, is a question not of split, of but of educating the party. It is my firm hope that the coming convention will ruthlessly repulse the revisionists. The convention, in my opinion, must declare categorically that in their attempts to divorce sociology from dialectic materialism and politics from sociology, the leaders of the opposition have broken from Marxism and become the transmitting mechanism for petty bourgeois empiricism. While reaffirming, decisively and completely, its loyalty to the Marxist doctrine and the political and organizational methods of Bolshevism, while binding the editorial boards of its official publications to promulgate and defend this doctrine and these methods, the party will, of course, extend the pages of its publication in the future to those of its members who consider themselves capable of adding something new to the doctrine of Marxism. But it will not permit a game of hide-and-seek with Marxism and like-minded jibes concerning it. The politics of a party has a class character. Without a class analysis of the state, the parties and ideological tendencies, it is impossible to arrive at a correct political orientation. The party must condemn as vulgar opportunism the attempt to determine policies in relation to the USSR from incident to incident and independently of the class nature of the Soviet state. The disintegration of capitalism, which engenders sharp dissatisfaction among the petty bourgeoisie and drives its bottom layers to the left, opens up broad possibilities but it also contains grave dangers. The Fourth International needs only those emigrants from the petty bourgeoisie who have broken completely with their social past and who have come over decidedly to the standpoint of the proletariat. This theoretical and political transit must be accompanied by an actual break with the old environment and the establishment of intimate ties with workers. In particular, by participation in the recruitment and education of proletarians for their party. Emigrants from the petty bourgeois milieu who prove incapable of settling in the proletarian milieu must, after the lapse of a certain period of time, be transferred from membership in the party to the status of sympathizers. Members of the party untested in the class struggle must be placed in responsible positions. Excuse me, must not be placed in responsible positions, excuse me. No matter how talented and devoted to socialism an emigrant from the bourgeois milieu may be, before becoming a teacher, he must first go to school in the working class. Young intellectuals must not be placed at the head of the intellectual youth, but sent out into the provinces for a few years, into the purely proletarian centers, for hard practical work. The class composition of the party must correspond to its class program. The American section of the Fourth International will either become proletarian or it will cease to exist. Comrade Burnham, if we can arrive at an agreement with you on the basis of these principles, then without difficulty we shall find a correct policy in relation to Poland, Finland, and even India. 
At the same time, I pledge myself to help you conduct a struggle against any manifestations whatsoever of bureaucratism and conservatism. So, me, conservatism. These, in my opinion, are the conditions necessary to end the present crisis. With Bolshevik greetings, Leon Trotsky, January 7th, 1940. Thanks for listening.